Hi everyone, I am Julian, your Biology 2600 Lab Instructor, and in this week we are going to deal with the Lab 9, our last lab, Landscape, Pattern, and Scale. So um, I already attempted to start this video, um, but I went off on a rant, and I thought it was interesting that you guys hear that, so I posted that uh, video, it's called uh, My Rant. Um, there's a link to it in Brightspace. I definitely suggest you look at it. It's just a few minutes long. Um, some useful information in there. So, this lab ties back to lab one, which is kind of my little effort to show you that everything in ecology is linked. Um, so we're going to be describing different landscape components. Um, we're going to look at what causes those landscape components. And this is all going to be done at different scales at Mon Botanical Gardens. So the purpose of this lab is to um, allow you to understand concepts of a patch and land cover type and highlight how scales affect descriptions of the landscape. So before watching this video, please read the lab file um, and the appropriate sections in the textbook and also refer to Dr. LaRue's lecture. All right, so let's get started with a definition so this lab focuses on landscape ecology so uh, i'm going to give you that definition uh, so landscape ecology examines how spatially heterogeneous patterns so physical structures interact with organisms or ecological processes so biological um, aspects within a region of interest so we're going to start with some definitions and um, some simple definitions and work our way up to more complicated ones. So perhaps the most basic um, observation that you can make within the environment is that of structure, which uh, can be defined as any physical object that occurs or exists in the environment. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples. And as you can see by some, I mean one. So the reason I have fir trees here uh, three times is because even with such a simple uh, structure, like a fir tree, you actually get quite a bit of variability. So it's often very useful to accompany um, the structure with a detailed description. Uh, and you're going to be doing something similar to that in this week's lab. So... Um, for example, um, fir trees can be young, so if they're young, they're usually shorter, and they're usually fully covered in branches and leaves. They could be a little bit uh, taller, which implies that they're older, and usually what happens, as we know from lab one, is that um, they form a canopy at the top and lose their branches and or leaves underneath that canopy. Or you can have a climax forest, in which case you have varying heights, which implies varying ages, varying leaf cover, and they can occur sparsely or they can be densely packed. So to give you some more examples of some other structure um, that you see in similar environment where you see fir trees, um, we can also see moss, uh, trails perhaps, and streams, and of course it's useful or beneficial to um, accompany these specific examples of structure with detailed descriptions and so you can look at those there so instead of um, classifying individual objects or structures um, it's often beneficial to take objects that are either similar in shape or occur in a similar area and classify them um, as a single unit and so that would be what you call a patch um, or an element and it's simply defined as a relatively homogeneous area that differs from its surroundings so um, for example all of these things we should know that they occur in a climax boreal forest so instead of listing each individual one you could say climax boreal forest patch and that summarizes this so um, of course um, if you have a patch, um, you have to have something that surrounds it, because by definition it's a unique unit, so you're going to have you, um, something around it. And that would be your matrix, which is simply defined as the area surrounding or in between patches. 
So as you can get from that definition, and also from uh, the fact that this is a two-headed arrow here, um, what you can get from that is that two of these are going to be complementary to another. So you cannot have one without the other. They're both going to exist in a particular area. This is going to take up one part of that area, and this is going to take up the rest of that area. So let's take a look at some examples. So we're going to start with a couple of quick, simple examples and then get to a more complicated one. So uh, this area shows uh, a decent portion of Atlantic Canada. So Newfoundland, uh, New Brunswick, PEI, um, Labrador. So let's say that our study was focused on um, some terrestrial organisms. So it could be, you know, fir trees, it could be moose. So both of those are going to occur specifically on the land. So um, our patches would include all of the land portions. And then everything else, uh, because patches are complementary to matrices, everything else is going to be your matrix. So relatively simple example. And so if, oh, got excited, if we were um, looking at some aquatic organisms, so I don't know, phytoplankton, codfish, uh, both of which occur specifically in the water, then our focal area or our patch would be the water and the land, which is in between the water, will form our matrix. So the idea is that they're complementary to each other and your patch is going to be specific to what you're looking at and then everything else will be the matrix. So that was a relatively, they were relatively simple examples. Um, this map here, which looks much prettier on my screen than it does on yours, but that's fine. Um, so this map here, uh, you can see that we got quite a number of things going on. So if we're looking at patches, which are composed of one or similar structures, we can still um, find something like that on this map. So let's say we're looking at sunflowers which are yellow on mine and a weird color on yours, um, you can still pick out all of the sunflowers. So the sunflowers in this patch are going to be really similar in structure to the sunflowers in this patch, sunflowers in this patch, and to the sunflowers in the rest of the patches. So our patch is still going to be homogeneous. However, our matrix now is not just a uh, one structure it's actually combined of a number of structures all of which are listed over on this side um, so our matrix is going to be heterogeneous so the specific area that we're going to be looking at is this area right here so just um, around the one botanical gardens um, and so what i want to point out is that um, the patch or patches that you're looking at plus the matrix because they're complementary again together form the landscape so um, we're going to be focused on this area right here so this is just a cutout version of the trail map that we saw in lab one um, so this is this is going to be our patch everything else is our matrix and just to make it one color so it's not black on my screen and it makes it hard to distinguish from the pond but either way this is the patch we're going to be focused on so this patch plus all of the matrix is our landscape so we can think of all of these structures or all of the objects that occur within the patch and that occur within the matrix together as forming a distinct pattern on this map. So this map is going to be unique. You're not going to find another map that is like this because of the unique layout of objects. And so this forms um, a unique landscape. So all of these unique objects that form a pattern form the unique landscape. So landscape is going to be one of those uh, relative things so if you look at the definition it depends on what you're looking at um, so starting with a basic definition it's just a combination or a mosaic of the distinct patches and the matrix 
uh, in a specific area. So you have two aspects. Uh, the composition encompasses spatial elements. So these are going to be the patches um, and their configuration. So how these patches are arranged. And like I was briefly talking about in the previous slide, these two together will form a unique pattern that is unique to the specific landscape that you're looking at. So there is uh, an idea or a concept called the landscape concept that states that the structures or the spatial patterns um, are going to influence the spatial patterns within the landscape are going to influence the ecological processes of that landscape. And this is um, not that far of a stretch um, or it's not that hard to grasp. So um, one of the things if you guys continue doing biology, one of the things you're going to see over and over and over is that structure equals function. And so that's essentially what um, this is saying here. So if we interpret natural landscapes, uh, specifically the patterns of the natural landscapes by the uh, patch matrix relationship, it will inform us of the underlying biological processes. So the landscape is going to be your structural aspect because of the patterns and your biological processes are going to form the function. So structure equals function. So um, now putting um, or adding that idea, we can add or come up with a new landscape definition, which is specifically based on the ecological perspective. And this would be a heterogeneous land area composed of a cluster of interacting systems. Um, so just a couple of things I want to point out. All landscape patches are going to be ecologically interconnected. Um, and as I kind of insinuated, landscape is going to affect the organisms. I didn't insinuate, yeah, I didn't insinuate, I said that straight up. Uh, landscape is going to affect the organisms and ecological processes, but what I didn't say is that the opposite is also true. The ecological processes and the organisms are also in turn going to affect the landscape. So, um, another thing to keep in mind is that habitat patches can only be defined relative to an organism's uh, perception and its scaling of the environment. So. Um, so if you take, if, if you look at um, the landscape from the perspective of a bacterium versus a mouse versus a blue whale, because of their uh, drastic size differences, they're going to interpret their landscape differently. And so the patch that they occur in or their landscape uh, is going to be different. And so if we take that idea, we can also come up with a landscape um, definition that has a spatial perspective. And this would be a spatial hetero heterogeneous area relative to an organism or phenomenon under the consideration. Um, so it's going to be specific to what you are looking at. So it's important to define the uh, what scale actually is and it's the resolution of which an organism perceives the environment, which um, I kind of stated. Um, so you're going to get uh, a couple of ways to describe this and they're going to be different and somewhat confusing. So I'm going to give you some examples. So ecological size is the actual size, like how big is something physically? So the uh, extent of the landscape under consideration. And this is going to be different from a map scale which is the ratio of a map to the actual real distance um, that it takes up and of course both of these um, are going to affect the resolution which can be fine or coarse so let's take a look at a specific example so um, this is the map that I showed earlier so uh, a map from Google Earth and this black area is just a cropped out version of the botanical gardens map. Next to it is the pond. I apologize that it's not distinguishable. 
Um, and down here, this is just uh, Google Earth again, but it's more zoomed in. So this is the pond and the little black patches are uh, the specific areas where the clips um, that you're going to be looking at were taken. So um, in terms of landscape and scale and all that stuff, um, this area up here, the diameter of this area is, and you could sort of pick it out here, is 2265 meters and this area here is uh, you can see down here a thousand and eighty meters so that makes sense this is zoomed out so it takes up a larger area so this is a larger number this is zoomed in takes up a smaller area so this is a smaller number and that is essentially what ecological um, scale is so it's just how big is the landscape area um, again, this is large and this is small. So large ecological scale, small ecological scale, large landscape area, small landscape area. So that portion is straightforward. Uh, the part that gets confusing is the scale map. So if we look at the scale, so on your screen, if you were to take out a ruler and actually measure from right here to right here, it's going to be somewhere between, I don't know, 5 and 15 centimeters. So let's just say 10 centimeters. Um, so that's the, that's the size that this area represents on your screen. 10 centimeters, approximately. And the total area, as I already mentioned, is 2265. Let's so keep that in mind. Down here, again, this area, um, or the, the size that this area takes up on your screen, is the same as this so it's about 10 centimeters and the total area that it represents is 1080 as I already mentioned so if you actually divide these numbers what you will see is that oh got excited what you'll see is that this number is smaller than this number down here and so that's why we say that this is a small scale map because it has it represents um, Sorry, because this number is bigger, so the scale, because the scale is smaller, and this number here is going to be bigger than this one, so this is called a relatively large scale map. And so we're not really going to talk a lot about that, but I just wanted to kind of explain it with some numbers so that you have an idea. So because this is zoomed out, it's going to have a coarser resolution, which means um, it's hard to distinguish smaller objects. Whereas this one, because it's zoomed in, is going to have a finer resolution. Um, so you you can actually pick out smaller objects and separate them as distinct, distinct objects on this map. So um, the, the whole purpose of going through all of that is uh, to mention this. So uh, the fact that you had different scales, the fact that we're looking at different scales um, means that you're going to have different drivers or controls. So drivers of or controls of pattern um, and the process. So there's going to be different physical and or biological processes that cause this specific landscape. And they're going to be different than the physical and biological processes that cause this landscape. And because the landscape or the pattern is different, you're going to have different controls and drivers. So different physical and biological processes that control the organisms or their activity on two of these scales. And because that's a little confusing, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So landscapes are created and change in response to geological processes, climate, fire, biological processes, so the um, activity of organisms, and anthropogenic activities. So if you don't know what anthropogenic means, um, it's essentially the effects of humans. So uh, cutting down trees, uh, making farms, putting in roads, everything that humans do. So. On a smaller scale, a uh, smaller ecological scale, so in a small area, so an area that takes up a tree or um, a, a small patch, 
the main drivers are going to be biological processes. So this includes the plant and animal activity in that area. It includes demographics, competition, predation, and dispersal. So at the trail level, so this is one of your questions, uh, uh, the main drivers are going to be intra and inter-specific competition for sunlight and water slash nutrients, um, the soil type and how much nutrients is in it and the quality overall, animal browsing, so how much of a certain tree is eaten by animals, etc. On the large scale, large ecological scale, so um, several patches in a matrix or an entire landscape, um, the main, the dominant drivers are going to be geological and physical processes. So this includes things like uh, climate. You can clearly see the effect of climate on vegetation when you look at a larger area. Geological processes like uh, glaciation. So we talked a bit about that at the lookout. Um, so uh, one of your questions on this is at the Google Earth scale. Um, so the main thing that you can see is boreal forests and the drivers for that, like I mentioned, are going to be climate. So Newfoundland has a cool and relatively short uh, growing season or summer, uh, if you want to call it a summer. Um, we also have high annual precipitation. Um, and um, as I mentioned, specifically at Botanical Gardens, there was uh, glaciers that uh, existed in that area 12,000 years ago-ish. And so um, the soil, you, you don't actually have uh, a very multi-layered or high quality topsoil in that area so it prevents growth of certain organisms but it allows growth of fir trees so that's the sort of type of stuff we're looking for there and so you also have um, an intermediate ish um, scale so I'm calling it middle scale uh, and that's really not an appropriate uh, term, but um, it, it essentially it refers to extreme gradients. I just noticed that I was using hand gestures, so making sure that you guys can't see that. So um, extreme gradients refer to um, steep hills. So this uh, simple little diagram here is meant to represent a cross section at botanical gardens. So you would have your look out way up here which is at the top of a steep hill and then you have your pond um, at the bottom and then you have some wooded area on the other side so um, um the purpose or the point of this is that this gradient here is gonna have an effect on the specific organisms that occur within it so um and also you're going to have a combination of landscape drivers so the ones that you see at a large scale and the ones that you see at small scale so in terms of uh, physical ones which typically are the drivers for large landscapes here uh, physical processes um, like temperature wind moisture are going to affect the growth of these organisms and biological processes which are the typical drivers for small landscapes um, like lack of nutrients in soil are going to affect um, the growth of these organisms in this area so um, <clears throat> the idea is up here um, you're on the lookout so it's super exposed so you have a lot of wind if it's raining you're going to have a lot of moisture but on the other hand all that moisture is going to run down the hill um, afterward if it's sunny it's going to be super sunny up here so you have lots of light but again this is a harsh environment so you're not going to see that many um, organisms here and so the ones that you do see are going to be specifically adapted to it um, 
as you get and so there's very little soil up here as well so as you get down the nutrients that are formed here eventually work their way down the hill and you see um, and not nicely depicted by this diagram but you see um, more luscious vegetation as you go down so short trees and gradually an increase in tree height so for this slide um, it's relatively simple um, I've included three different pictures so these pictures are shown here but they're also in your lab file and I'll show you that in a second so these are at three ecological scales um, this is a view from Google Earth this is a view from the lookout at Botanical Gardens and this is a view at one of the trails at Botanical Gardens so ground level um, so you're going to discuss the different types of vegetation that you can pick out from these three different views and the drivers um, and so that's there's a couple questions based on that the first thing though is you're going to have a matching question where you have six video clips um, uh, from different trails at botanical garden and you're going to match those to um, six detailed descriptions so this is kind of the idea of matching a detailed description to a specific patch so i'm going to show you what that looks like oh. um, da, da, da. So if you go to Brightspace and you go to Biology 2600 Labs Lab 9, um, you will see two files there. Um, so there's going to be another file there before you guys or once you guys actually see it. Uh, the first one is your lab file though. Uh, and the second one is a video of the cliffs and of course I'm going to add a link to this video as well so I have those open up here so I'm going to start with the cliffs um, so you got my lovely intro and oh, quiet and then so you just have clearly labeled clips and what comes after it is a clip of the video so this is clip three and you wait a second and this is me taking the video at a specific portion of the trail so in your lab file if you scroll down so you got your background here specifically what you have to do a little summary diagram right here it clearly says matching question site descriptions so you have uh, a bunch of descriptions here and you have to figure out which one goes with which clip and so when you submit this it's just going to be a file word document clip one matches description whatever so let's just give you an example so we looked at clip three which was had a woody area at first and then went into an open area so if you scroll down and you look whoop, transition from an area with stratified blah 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 to an area with mainly grasses variety some canopy to no canopy so clip three matches to description five so there you go you got one of them done that's the benefit of watching these videos um, so that's what you're going to do for the first part for the second part um, oh and also I mentioned your pictures are also here and they're nicely labeled for the second part you're just going to answer some simple questions and so I talked about these um, pretty much gave you I, I did give you the answer to some of these in uh, earlier in the video so for example for each of the three scales um, talk about the land cover that you see and so I mean if you look here you see a variety of land cover so herbaceous plants some grasses maybe some ferns spruce trees fir trees uh, deciduous trees here you get a nice gradual decrease so really short trees up here and then higher trees down there here you just see boreal forest you can't pick out individual trees so that's the sort of the stuff we're looking at um, 
make sure you don't discuss anthropogenic pattern. So the fact that this is a uh, rock crushed stone was placed on this trail, you don't want to mention that. And then you're going to discuss the main driver. So I definitely mentioned this portion. Um, so down here you have things like competition, predation, browsing, whereas the main effect up here would be uh, climate, uh, geological processes, that sort of stuff. This is the one that is matches the middle area or the extreme grading. So you get your information from there. Um, and then that question is pretty straightforward. So all you do is match your clips to your descriptions, um, answer these questions on a Word document, upload it to Brightspace, and you are finished. And that's it for ecology. Again, um, hope to see you guys in botany. Um, I'll mention that, you know, I, I had TAs and I used to make fun of people that enjoyed plants. And then, sure enough, my luck, I ended up getting assigned, being assigned botany as a lab instructor. And it, it was fascinating. Students were great. Materials great. Uh, Dr. Ronco is great. It's just, it's just a good experience. And it's, I mean, in terms of content, it's, it is relatively easy as I, two other biology courses, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it's also case, um, it's also a great elective. So I know some of you guys are psychology majors and you're not really into biology. That's, it's a good choice for you guys. Um, last time I did it was about half and half biology and psychology. So definitely one of the preferred choices because probably it's easier. All right, guys, that's it.